Mm. Welcome to the fourth episode of Eastern World 2014 Recaps from Reality TV Warriors. My name is Michael Harmstone, and joining me as always is the Canadian who we associate with Derriere, what a bastard, Logan Saunders. Good afternoon. And the guy who thinks he has everything, but he has nothing really, David Bindley. I'm surprised that wasn't a bassoon joke. No, as Logan well knows, we did the bassoon jokes in Japan, I'm afraid. Oh, that's a shame. In the school challenge in Japan, the the instrument that they have to identify is mistaken for the bassoon. Ah. And I uh, I ended up Googling it live on the podcast, and uh, we fell about laughing with that. So I wasn't touching that one with a badge pole. No. You don't, you don't really need to touch it with a badge pole. You just need to stick it in your mouth and blow. It's like a bagpipe. Hmm. And after all the shenanigans with Menifer last week, um, it seems we have a bit more Menifer to talk about this week. She gets the whole episode named after her. What up with that? I had completely forgotten that that happens until I started watching the episode, paused it, and sent Bindle the message just going, oh my god, at the episode title. I don't even remember why they titled it Menifer. Neither do I, which is even funnier. Like most of the episode titles, as as we well know, will refer to the mole in some capacity. I don't remember why they titled it Menifer. It eludes me even, even now, eight years later. So, previously, Sophie and Frake posted all their money to Alice Island, much to the disgust of Arf and Tico. Arf's drumming helped them win a dragon boat race before the girls teamed up, and Daphne became an alliance tramp, which we didn't see in the original episode, but is a wonderful quote that makes it to the previously on section. Given the choice of who sees their screen, the real red screen holder didn't see anything, sending the entire group through to episode 4. Art tells us that only three people saw their screen in an intense execution. The group has split, unbeknownst to the men, the women have a pact with their intention to get three women to the finale, assuming the mole is in their midst. And does anyone want to attempt the episode title? Uh, I'm going to guess Menifer. Menifer, yeah, I think that's the correct pronunciation. Yeah, in, in English we would say Jennifer, but in uh, in Dutch they do pronounce it, for some reason, Menifer. I can do all the other Dutch ones, but this one is really hard. Yeah, this one's just, it's a step too far for any of us, I think. It's a real tongue twister. I had to put all of my linguistic knowledge to, to the test here. Has there ever been a, any other time where they name an episode just after a contestant's first name? I don't think so, because they didn't start doing episode titles until about season 12 or 13. It's a far later invention than you'd think. Hmm. And they're having lunch and relaxing outside of the game when the phone rings. Art says all of them will get their chance one by one in the next challenge, and they will have to pick their order between them. It would be a good idea for the last person to be trusted, which of course immediately rules Tico out. I like how right after they show the episode title, they immediately talk to Menifer, and she's eating a pastrami sandwich, so now I'm expecting the next episode title to just be pastrami sandwich. And skipping to the end of the episode, you didn't even make her your number one. It would have been a supremely ballsy thing for them to do to make the moles name the episode title, surely. Especially for the fourth episode. M-O-L-E. Good point. Four is, as we know, the number of the mole. So it could just be a massive double bluff from them. So Menifer says it's tough to determine what to do. Should they send someone they don't suspect, or should they pick who they think the mole is to test them? They decide to pick someone and point to them as most trusted, and most of the women point to Yan Billum. It's day seven in Hong Kong still, and it's time for a game on the longest escalator in the world. Arthur had heard about it beforehand, but was surprised it was a series of escalators rather than one long one. This is a really, really weird landmark. Yeah, if anyone in this cast was going to know that Hong Kong had the longest the longest escalator in the world, I think it probably would have been Arf. Oh, yeah. But I, I don't think I visited this when I was in Hong Kong. I don't remember visiting this. And on your left-hand side, you'll see a series of short escalators that add up to an incredible distance. And on the right is a clock tower. (laughs) Yeah, unless it goes up to Victoria Peak, I don't think I went on this escalator. And that is a sentence I never thought I would be saying until this podcast. I like how just, because other towns, especially within Canada, will try to come up with some sort of landmark to make it distinct. Hong Kong doesn't really need that to try and build something like that. The longest series of escalators that add up to the greatest distance. Yeah, Hong Kong kind of has other landmarks that are kind of more important. Yeah, what's next? They're going to just try to create the biggest nickel? 
Apparently, it's the central mid-levels escalator and walkway system, and is the longest outdoor covered escalator system in the world, and covers over 800 metres in distance, and traverses an elevation of over 135 metres from bottom to top. It'd be really close to how long the escalators are for the... Damn it, that landmark in Yerevan, Armenia, because that's a long series of escalators to ride down before you reach the bottom. The Yerevan Cascades. The Cascades, yes. That's the name of it. Because that takes a few minutes to get down. Interestingly as well, it does have a filming location section on Wikipedia, none of which have used them all. And um, the Dark Knight film there, from the hmm. 6th to the 11th of November, because apparently it takes six days to film at the longest escalator in the world. Those are some long escalators. No wonder they had such a hard time trying to keep track of all these words. Yeah. And to cut Bindle's challenge guide for this episode, yes, it's literally Chinese whispers in China. Because the person at the bottom, in this case Tico, is given a list of words and has three minutes to remember them, and then pass them on to the next person in line. I wish the words were funnier. Well, where would you want to be as a mole in this challenge? You'd either want to be at the chalkboard or the one listening to everybody else, because then you you're unaccounted for in both roles, essentially. Yeah, because even rewatching this challenge, knowing who the mole is, it didn't feel really like anyone other than Tico was moling in this challenge. Yeah, well, I wrote a few th- wrote a few things in here about potential sabotages. No, well, the- it is very interesting when men of a lampshades at a little bit at the end of this challenge, going, "I don't think the mole did anything because they knew that Jan Willem would be able to listen in." But it didn't feel to me like anyone other than Tico was sabotaging this, and Tico is obviously just doing it to be a prick. Because the interesting thing is, Alf wanted everything to be in alphabetical order in the previous episode, and then this episode she wanted the order to be reverse alphabetical order leading into Jan Willem. Yeah, Alf always seems to be in the right place at the right time, whenever any challenge like this comes up. And then here she gets to be on the chalkboard, which is the source of all the money going into the pot, because Jan Willem is presented with the information of, oh, if you sub in Tigo to take this test, then you can only earn one-seventh of the potential earnings, and then escalates to an extra seventh for each other person that does it. So there's a high, high incentive to keep off as the test taker. And then off would know that Jan Willem can hear what everyone else is saying, so then she's the only person who's unaccounted for for transferring the words to somebody else. She just has to switch it over to the chalkboard, and by that point, she can intentionally miss the words that she knows wasn't transferred to, to her correctly and only put up a couple words and say, oh, even if there was one that was missing a transfer that Jan Willem might have heard, she could say, oh yeah, I just forgot about that one because of all the extra other information that was thrown at me that was incorrect. And then Yennefer has that ridiculous story. It was like that episode of Michael Scott with the lawsuit where him and Jan have to testify for Jan's court hearing. And she's trying to coach him on what to say in front of all the people that are there. And he just comes up with these ridiculous, ridiculous stories or word association mnemonics for it. And then Jan just says, is this, is this really going to help you remember it? And that's all I could think of when, when Menifer is doing the same thing of what? Uh, you you think that really long-winded story about tying a word to a full sentence is going to help you remember those specific words and not the other ten words you're throwing into each individual sentence? There is a wonderful moment when Menifer is trying to relay her entire story to Frake, where he just looks so bored. <laughs> and it it's almost a perfect replica. I don't know whether you've seen the meme of the girl in the nightclub who's just there's a guy right in her face and she he's just shouting something at her and it's almost a perfect <laughs> replica it. it's so so funny I, I love how every single other person was like oh it's an abc thing and, and she just completely didn't notice it even tico spotted it even tico and then freak piles on saying a six-year-old would notice that it's abc <laughs> that was michael jackson's first song that entire challenge is so, so funny to me. And then Susan, when she's relaying the words to Sophie, she says them extremely fast. Sophie says, how can I keep up? You're just spitting one word out after the other. I can't even absorb the previous word because you're already three w- words further into the list. And then Susan is annoyed because Sophie keeps interrupting her train of thought as she's trying to spit out all 20 words at once. 
So Tico says he's good at learning text off by heart, but not in three minutes. The others don't know what the rules are, so they've got to pass those on too, as well as the 20 words. He passes on the wrong E word and the wrong F word, much to our amusement during Japan. And he passes them on to Susan, who uses the mnemonic and calls him a bastard to associate him with derriere. And he thinks that he passed maybe 16 or 17 words on. <laughs> and then uh, when he does the word for M, he just substitutes with his favorite motherfucker, I think, in there. And Susan's just like, I don't, I don't think that would be on the Venom word list. I think my favorite thing is I was, like I was keeping track of where the words went missing. About half of them go missing between Tigo and Susan. Because Tigo only passes on 14 out of 20, and then by the end they still have like 10 or 11. Yeah, my favorite thing is Susan, when she can't remember them, just starts adding in other ones like <laughs> opium. Because all good situations, especially when you're in China, need opium. Mr. Mace, I didn't guess purple monkey dishwasher. <laughs> but I also love Susan's confessional when she's saying how she was relaying them to Sophie, and she's just like, put a sock in it and concentrate. I think this is another piece of evidence where Susan and Sophie probably don't get on. I hadn't noticed. No way. There's a little bit of residual tension between the two of them any time they have to work together. It's always just a little bit delicious when it happens. And I don't know what it is with Menifer, but once again, actually it might have been Sophie too that was involved. But they, when they're exchanging words and they have to come up with a sentence for Derriere again, I'm thinking... This is just like the great uh, Maze mini game they did during the second episode. Yeah, I do appreciate that whenever anyone mentions the word derriere in this challenge, they always immediately think of Tico. <laughs> For some reason, this entire group, as well as us, just just completely associate Tico with being an arse. It's so strange. Who knew butts were going to be such an important feature this season? One thing that did spring to mind when I was watching this challenge... Do you think that the mole had extra impetus to stop a red screen being seen last week to make this challenge hard? Because this is a very easy challenge for them to adapt between seven and eight people. And with eight people there, there's one extra step of it being a bit of a bigger pain in the arse for them. That's a good point. It's one extra year where the words can be dropped. Mm. Because we said at the end of last episode that it was a bit weird that there was absolutely no consequences to them having a non-elimination. And I'm wondering whether the consequence actually ended up being this challenge, and this challenge being infinitely harder because nobody saw a red screen. I don't know how they do the damn challenge with uh, with only seven people. That probably wouldn't work as well. Or indeed the item exchange. But this challenge can definitely be done with seven or eight people. So Menifer rattles off her wedding story to Frake, who immediately cuts the bullshit and talks to her about it being alphabetical. And by the time that Menifer has passed on her words, there are only 10 of the 20 left. Daphne is then next. Frake doesn't make a single mistake and is very, very calm with his rattling it off. And she is able to pass on to Arth clearly. And then Arth meets Art. So Arth meets up with Art and is allowed to fill in some of the words on the blackboard. Most of the words she'd remembered were already written down, and she writes down four of them. Jan Willem, as you said, is then given the choice of whether to let Arth's answer stand or give someone else another chance. The earlier the person he chooses, the less money that will go into the pot, and the amount per correct answer increases by 25 euros for the person that he picks. Did you notice what they did with the words that they, they, they were already on the list? I didn't, know. I know they draw attention to this at the finale, and I can't remember why. Okay, so there's a psychological principle called the primacy and recency effect. So basically, if you get like a long list of things to remember, you remember the first few and you remember the last few. And basically, those were the ones that they gave you already. So you had ah. A, B, C, D, and then down the bottom you had R, S, T, all done. So it was basically a lot of the middle ones were the ones that they had to fill in. So the challenge was even harder because of that. Yeah, it's like first year psychology that you learn is, yeah, first and last you'll remember, then everything in the middle tends to drop out quick. Yeah, I've heard about that in relation to gigs, because the theory with gigs on the same line is that you can play a great first song and play a great last song and nobody remembers what you play in the middle, because everyone just has a good time as long as your first and last songs aren't shy. So that makes a lot of sense. So he says the only other option was to ask Tico, and there's no guarantee he'd remember anything more than Arf did, because it's Tico. He leaves Arf's answers in place, and two of those are correct, giving them a total of 350 euros of 1,750. In the words of Oscar Schindler, it could have been so much more. No, these were escalators, not lifts. So Jan Willem reveals he heard everything, and he knows who sabotaged this challenge. 
and they realised that Emotion and Bassoon were never on the list, and it went wrong right off the bat with Tico. Frake then confronts Menifer with the lack of alphabetising the words. She thinks there was absolutely no sabotaging going on, as the mole knew that Jan Willem would be listening in. He thinks he has everything, but really, he has nothing. Yeah, if, the, if that's what they're saying in the edit, then someone clearly sabotaged it. If you're saying, oh, there's no way the mole could have messed up prior to... Uh... No one could have messed it up at any point in the challenge or, or do it intentionally as the mole because Jan Wall can hear everything thinking, nope, there are definitely ways. Oh, I mean, Bindles and I were chatting about this uh, a few days ago. This entire episode is is very heavily sabotaged. The mole does a lot of work in this episode. So they wake up on day eight and discuss the envelopes again. Jan Willem wants to post something that evening, but there is the small issue of him still not having his envelope not that he has declared it to anyone in the group. And Tico yet again gloats that he has two envelopes. There's a lot of gloating. This scene goes on for, for a good chunk of time. Why isn't Jan Willem telling anybody? He doesn't really say the rationale behind that decision. I think he assumes that the mole probably took it. Because the best way for a mole to do anything with, with this twist is one of three routes. It's either take an envelope from someone else, and you take one of the envelopes out, so they have to risk far more if they actually post an envelope otherwise. You don't post anything yourself, or you post something really late yourself, and make sure you don't send it to someone who's actually going to be there. So I think I think Jan Willem is going into this just assuming that the mole probably swipes his envelope, and that as soon as it's revealed who has a second envelope, that person's going to be the mole. Whether he's right, I mean, I would say whether he's right, we'll find out, but we all know that Tico isn't the mole, so that's yeah. redundant. <laughs> yeah, swing and a miss. But it's an interesting it's an interesting situation. I can't remember when it actually gets resolved. That's the other thing. I can't remember when the second envelope actually ends up turning it up. Maybe Tico eats it? But I mean, from a mole's point of view, taking the second envelope is a great thing because it, it reduces the chance that the team are actually going to post a significant amount of money. Yeah, Tigo's just sabotaging it for the sake of sabotaging it. There isn't really... And he's not telling anybody about it, so it's not like he's drawing more suspicion onto himself by taking the envelope. He's just doing it to be mildly douchey. Yeah, I mean, thinking back to Renaissance, I couldn't remember exactly why I hated Tico. And four episodes into the season, I know exactly why I hated Tico. Because he is everything I hate in someone on reality TV. He is needlessly aggressive. He is 100% mugging for the cameras. And he's just trying to get himself an invite for an all-star season. So if somebody made a YouTube compilation for Tigo, the song I Hate Everything About You by Three Days Grace would play. Yeah. I mean, dating the podcast slightly, we are two days into Survivor SA having its first all-star season. And I have watched one episode and I'm not watching the rest of it. Because five minutes into that first episode, someone who was in the upper echelon of that cast, in terms of people I don't hate, because there's a lot of them in that cast, said, oh yeah, I was just playing the last time to try and get an invite back for All-Stars. And it's like, why? Play properly the first time? You're remembered much better if you do that, you moron. And then you don't need to, you know, starve yourself twice. But she barely got invited back, right? She was the one that was gone, like, second or third, wasn't she? Uh... Fourth, I think. Fourth, yeah, she was gone really early. Yeah, I mean, they've brought back her first boot, so she's not the earliest person they brought back. There's an entire tribe of people who were voted out before the merge. Yeah, it's an interesting way of dividing them up. Yeah, which I think makes them at most like seventh or eighth boot in a season. It's, it's almost like running out of ideas and then, and then outsourcing production to podcasters is a bad idea. Unless it's us. Yes. I mean, if anyone wants to make us produce a mole season, I'm definitely down for that. Oh, yes. You know where we are. And by we, I mean me. So do you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so Arf already has her envelope ready to go, and she sends 350 euros to Ellis Island, addressed to Daphne, as she will make the finale for sure. <laughs> I, I love how in this scene she's basically like, oh, mail sounds like fun, which is, you know, more proof that she's secretly 78 years old. Oh, snail mail. I remember the good old days. Does anyone here remember the Pony Express? I will say this now. It is an absolute crime that Arf didn't get invited back for Renaissance if she wasn't the mole. 
and it is an absolute crime that they excluded people who made the finale if Arf was the mole. Because Arf is perfect casting. Yes. I just realized just now that Arf sent money to the person who got executed. Yeah. And the editors even include a confessional from Arf saying, Daphne will make the finale for sure. She saw her own screen. She knows who to rule out. She can't screw up that badly. Right, right, uh, Barbara? I also think from the context clues at the execution, I don't even think they say this at the finale, but I, I think Daphne would have gone home last week as well. I think she did Barbara herself here. <laughs> so she would have gone home. She would have gone home three times in four episodes. Yeah. She just really wasn't made for the game. I'm pretty sure from what Art said that Daphne probably would have gone home in episode three. Yeah, because he said, oh, so one of you was on borrowed time from last round. Yeah, and then he goes through all the people who didn't see their screens last time. Yeah, it had to have been Daphne then. I'm pretty sure it was. So they are then taken to the second assignment, which takes place at what they call a big colonial location, but it's actually 1881 Heritage, a building which is the old Marine Police Headquarters in uh, Sim Chao Sui for the second assignment. They are sat in front of a table, and Art promises them a treat. In front of them are eight rewards in eight envelopes, with a list of the rewards on the front of each envelope. What is inside the envelopes is a mystery. They all then snatch an envelope, but have to keep it closed. Art says the important thing is not what's currently in their envelope, but what will be in their envelope. They have two minutes to strategize in silence before they have to swap what they have with one person only. I like how it essentially becomes a game of spoons when they grab the envelopes. Just the mad scramble for it. I'm, I'm surprised none of the envelopes uh, ripped or were torn. I'm quite surprised I'd forgotten about this challenge because it's a very interesting one that they like to put in before they then put the Black Exemption into a season. I mean, Sophie quite blatantly knows exactly what is about to happen in terms of the Black Exemption. But it's an interesting way for them to do it, because nowadays they just put them on a path of temptation to introduce all these these twists in. This is a much more exciting challenge than a path of temptation, especially after we've done it, you know, ten seasons in a row now. And also they they do something interesting with the money and then don't give them the rules until it's too late anyway. Hmm. So Susan has half of fifteen hundred euros, Daphne has two yokers, and because they were in envelope four, which is the fourth one on the list. She theorises that the numbers line up with what they contain, so Arf must have the exemption in envelope number one. Arf, however, has nothing. Jan Willem has one yoker, which is the worst position in his mind. Menefer has three yokers, which is the first time all season she's had any yokers. Freik has the other half of 1,500 euros. He says he trusts Sophie, so if he gives her the money, he knows that it will be safe. Sophie has the exemption, and therefore the most to lose, and Tico has three yokers. Art then turns the hourglass. Jan Willem wants to make a deal with whoever has the exemption. Tico says he has the best offer, as he has three yogas. During this whole challenge, they're playing Harry Potter music. Yeah, it's very rare in Vidim that they play any probably filmy music anymore. It was, used to be a trope of all the older seasons. But uh, yeah, they do play Harry Potter music throughout this uh, this entire scene. This music I've heard a million times, because it's uh, if you have the Harry Potter Seen It DVD board game, this is the music they play during the pause menu. Tico offers to trade with Menifer. She says that if he's this good at lying, she will never trust him again. And they quickly trade. And Tico acts to the group like she burned him. Yeah, I believe he calls her a, a, a Menifucker. Arf claims that she has two yokers, and Daphne makes the trading eyes, but Arf avoids her, as she doesn't want to screw her over. It's a, it's a page straight out of the Rob Sabachnik playbook. Don't make eye contact, don't make eye contact, don't make eye contact. You, you weren't in the attack zone when you made eye contact. <laughs> if Arf can't see Daphne, then Daphne can't see Arf. She's invisible. That's how it works. Can I just say, I really want to play poker with Arf after this challenge, because her poker face is terrible. I really want to just be friends with Arf, I'll be honest. She joins the very long list of Vidum people who I would love to be friends with. Top of the list is, of course, Peter Yan. You were not in the attack zone when he first made eye contact. That's another envelope for Chewy Gone. <laughs> Come on, guys, I sound like a broken record. So Sophie and Frank trade. She just didn't even think about it. Susan and Daphne then trade, and Susan wasn't telling her the truth. And that leaves Jan Willem and Arf to trade, 
and Jan Willem to get absolutely screwed. Art then returns and says that in order for the 1500 euros to be put in the pot, those two people who had them had to trade. They didn't, so nothing was earned for the pot. Would you have figured that out on your own if you were in this challenge? I would have been suspicious of the money, especially as it said half of 1500 euros. Whenever you see a half of note in Vidum, you have to get suspicious as to how it's possible to get the other half. They always have to be put together somehow. So I think it requires a little bit of genre savvy, and Sophie is obviously the person who is most genre savvy in this cast. But I think it requires a little bit of genre savvy and a little bit of Vidum experience to go, nothing's what it seems. How do we earn the money in this challenge? I don't know if I would have caught if I would have pieced it all together. I would think there would be something involved in the money, but I don't know if I would catch on that the money would have to be traded. I think the question is whether you would actually focus on the money. Because if you didn't care about the money, I don't think anyone really bothers that much about the money. I think the money's an afterthought. Would they have succeeded if Art told them that the money had to be traded? They would have had more of a chance. I, I think somebody probably would have been like, okay, I've got one half, who's got the other half? And then they would have traded and then they just everyone else just would have kept going. Yeah, it would have been a question as to whether Susan and Freight would have put the 1,500 euros in the pot between them. What item would you have wanted in your envelope at the start of the challenge if you were going to trade? Nothing. Neat. You got nothing to lose. Literally. <laughs> I'm surprised that confessional was not made during the episode. Yeah, nothing is the absolute answer to that question because even if you had one yoker in your envelope, You've only got a 1 in 7 chance of being screwed, but you've still got more of a chance of being screwed than if you've got nothing in your envelope to begin with. That makes sense. I think the question is what the mole would have wanted in their envelope. A gummy worm. Because the mole won't have known who had what. That's the thing. The mole's powers here are entirely dependent on their knowledge of everyone else's poker faces. And their abilities to persuade people. Yo, if you're the mole and you had the money envelope... You'd want to deflect as much attention from the money being even a part of this discussion the whole time. And who had the money was Sophie and... Susan and Frank. Oh, Susan and Frank. Oh, right. Sophie had nothing to... Or Sophie had the rice jelly, right? Yeah. Sophie I, I and think, Frank. I think from the mole's point of view, the mole doesn't necessarily need to have the money. The mole needs to know where at least one half of the money is and try and claim it or try and make sure that they don't give it to the other person if they've already got it. I like how Daphne always gets outplayed by everybody, because her and Susan trade, and then Daphne just receives money, which ends up being worthless. And then she says, what? What? I got played? (laughs) I got fooled? On a game show? I got fooled again? I'm on the wrong track? What a surprise. I do love it at the end of the episode when Art says, oh, you were a great contestant. And I'm just thinking, you were the one person I forgot in this cast. and You, you got to get executed con- three times. You just keep constantly getting played by other people. Were you that great a contestant, as lovely as you were? Probably not. I like how Susan just says, you know what? I feel bad for Daphne <laughs> by episode four. I'm going to give her one of my yokers. It's not going to help her that much, but At least I'm not going to go to hell for it. I was not last in the test. I was tied for last. (laughs) Oh, Terry and Ian. Fritz took 55 seconds on this quiz. Daphne took 20 minutes. Damn you tiebreakers. I would have loved it if she'd swapped in for for Sana and she just asked at the end, oh, did it come down to time? And Pete Ian just turned around and went, yeah, you were 19 and a half minutes slower than him. While we were waiting for you to complete the quiz, I fit in an entire Simpsons episode before you were done. I I had a chance to recite Pi to a Thousand Numbers in the time that it took you to do the test. What the hell were you playing at? I successfully listened to the entire Marshall Mathers LP. And boy, oh boy, do I have a recommendation for you on your flight home from Hong Kong back to Amsterdam. So then we get the post-challenge debrief. Of Susan saying she owes Daphne big time. Daphne took a gamble, it didn't pay off again. And she has to share them, and Susan says yes. Sophie says she expects another black exemption to be put into play with this many advantages entering the game, and demands to Frake that he finds it and gives it to her 
and in return, she won't play it when he plays his green exemption. He is delightfully non-committal and says that it's each to their own now at final eight. Yeah, it's a bit premature. I wrote that in my notes too. I'm thinking, it's too early to be making these types of confessionals. It's like Survivor Amazing Race where they say, I'm done I'm done with honoring deals. I'm done with these alliances. Every every person for themselves. I'm thinking, it's, it's episode four, Freak. It's episode four. There's still eight people left. You barely started this game. Daphne's not even out yet. It is an interesting situation, though, because even though it's final eight, there are only five more episodes after this where anyone can get eliminated. Yeah, but Daphne was still there. The dead weight is still in the season, but those people are going to go very quickly in this season, in theory. There may or may not be another non-elimination coming. So Tico refuses to tell Jan Willem what he got. Jan Willem says it's an on-again, off-again relationship between the two of them. And then they are taken to the final challenge at a dam, or around the corner from a dam, because they don't know it yet. Art trolls them and tells them that Yokas and Exemptions are now in play, they'll need them soon, as they need to get ready for an exciting challenge. I love how he just fucked with them for no reason. There is absolutely no reason he needs to do that. He just enjoys messing with these people a bit too much, I think. I know this isn't the point, but I was what I was looking at the scene and I was thinking... I love how like everyone else is wearing their absolute radius clothes, and then Arf is there in mum jeans. So they are told to pair up, and make sure that one person in each team doesn't have a problem looking up to the other. Tico and Sophie pair up quickly as they decide to pair tall people up with shorts. Menifer and Daphne pair up, so that Menifer can observe how she operates, and that leaves Susan and Jan Willem and Arf and Freik to pair up as well. They then see the dam, and Jan Willem says that when you see a dam on Vistamol, you know that somebody's going to be abseiling down it. They then split up, and Sophie, Menifer, Susan, and Arf meet Art. They're told that the other four will be abseiling down to grab tubes from a wire with money on them. If they correctly pick the true statements, the tubes will contain money, but any wrong statements will mean minus money. The abseilers hang over the edge, and Sophie gives Tico strict instructions about there not being a time limit, so don't rush through it. Which one of you is abseiling, and which one of you is answering the questions? Logan is abseiling. Yeah, me abseiling. Not a question. I've abseiled before, and I'm 6'5". It doesn't work with me. If it helps, I'm 5'6". I went rock climbing once, and basically I let go of the wall, so it was like indoor place. I basically fell fell off the wall, and because the rope was that long, it was like you know, 20, 25 metres or something, I ended up basically flying across the room and bashing headfirst into the wall on the other side of the room. Yeah, I've done that as well. Well, not on the other side of the room, but I banged into the wall I'm meant to be abseiling down. I think I have mentioned this on the podcast before, but I've done done go eight before, which is like high wires, ropes course. And I was in London for a course, so I had a day off and I thought, oh, I'll do go eight. They got one in uh, one in Battersea Park. And I was literally the only person on the course, which was amazingly fun because it was like midday, midweek. And it goes above a play area at one point. And my instructor was kind of keeping an eye on me and just chatting to this woman below. And... Um, this woman below was asking about the safety harness, and this instructor shouts up to me and, uh, and goes, "I'll just um, just deliberately fall off so you can show how the uh, the security harness works." And I went, "No, not doing that. I'm going to ignore you and just get walking." <laughs> I'm not bad with heights; it's the falling that I'm not good at. I'm okay with like zip wires and stuff, but if you ask me to hang in midair, not going to happen very very comfortably. Yeah, you want to test out. You want to test out the last chance safety line for me. If that breaks, you fall a hundred feet to your death. The second time I did, uh, I did go eight, which was during our first lockdown when work went down to four days a week. So I had one day off a week, and I did a bigger one nearer to home. And they got what they call the Tarzan swing, which is jumping off a platform into a cargo net, climbing up the cargo net, and then carrying on. And I actually had to sit down on this platform to be able to do the, the Talzin swing because it was the only way I was going to force myself to do it. Because there is not a chance in hell that I was actually going to physically jump off the platform. I kind of just slid off the platform and went face first into this cargo net and just did it once and never going to do that again. Because, yeah, that was not pleasant. There was an instructor directly below me and I didn't realise this. And all he heard was me just going, Fuck! Why did I do this to myself? And the first I knew of him being there was just when I heard him pissing himself laughing. There's a place like that sort of basically just down the road from my work. And I'm like, 
I'm not walking down there to see what it's like. <laughs> I'm not like I'm not even getting that close. I really enjoyed doing it, but I'm just not good when I'm dangling. That's what it boils down to. But yeah, I would not do well hanging off a dam attached to a harness. I would be deeply uncomfortable. Is the short answer to that long, long anecdote. So the first statement is that Jan Willem has read Alf's diary. It is correct, but they don't know that, and they end up skipping that statement. Daphne wore a red shirt at the first execution, so Freight grabs a tube. Jan Willem says that he enjoyed not picking up tubes, just so he could fly down the dam like an action hero. Obviously, Tico enjoys himself, given he's basically the annoying wannabe action hero archetype that was coined by Daniel in South Africa. Jan Willem then picks up the fourth tube instead of the third. Assuming the statement is correct, there was 1,500 euros available in the market, not 2,000 euros, and therefore, assuming that is true, I'm going to amend my figures at the end of this episode. Sophie sneakily tells Tico to grab the last tube, and he puts it in his underwear and doesn't declare it to anyone else. And I had completely forgotten that this is the method that the Black Exemption returns into the game. Do you think there's a Black Exemption at the end of everyone's line? Or was it just Sophie and Tico? I think it was just them. Was it their line specifically? Because didn't everyone finish at roughly around the same spot? Yeah, that's what I mean, because it's a bit unfair if it was just look at the draw who was going to get the option to put the Black Exemption in the game. And we know from Oregon that they are really, really not averse to putting more than one Black Exemption in the game at the same time, and the same with China. So I wouldn't be surprised if everyone got the offer. I just don't know how if everyone got the offer nobody spotted Tico taking the tube. I don't think we ever even find out, like in the reunion, how he got it. No, it was just taking that last tube. Presumably the last tube said Black Exemption instead of 250 euros inside. Yeah, did everyone feed into roughly the same spot when they got off the dam? I think they were all quite separate lines. Did Tigo have to go far at all, or was it just really just underneath his feet when he grabbed it? Tico was the far right line, so I think they were all attached to the same line. They were all reasonably easy to get. It's just that Tico was the only one to grab the bottom one. Yeah, but then there's a fifth tube for everybody across? I presume so, yeah. It could have been that everyone had the chance for it then. Maybe they were willing to risk that many black exemptions being found and figured. I mean, only the the savviest uh, fanatic in the cast was the only one who caught on to grab the fifth tube. They probably figured it'd be pretty low probability overall, especially after what happened with the envelope challenge. I think it's a little bit unfair that they actually got the opportunity to get the black exemption if nobody else did. Yeah, I hope it was that there was in all of the final tubes. And they just banked on not having too many pairings find it. It's not really a very interesting challenge. It was all pretty much a Trojan horse to grab that black exemption at the end. Yeah. The only other I mean, interesting thing was what that Jan Willem looked in Off's journal. Do you think someone was always going to be claiming that black exemption? Yeah. No. Because <laughs> I feel like if only one black exemption was available, then Tico is the person you probably want to put it in the hands of just because he's reckless enough to play it whenever he wants. But also he's a pain in the ass and you don't want to deal with him being around any longer than he has to be. The most chaos would ensue from Tigo being in possession of any advantage or disadvantage in the game. I wish the questions were more revealing, because a lot of things, I mean, you had, oh, did Jan Willem look in Off's journal? The next question is, oh, did somebody accidentally sneeze on the uh, on a plate of food and then passed it off to somebody else? It could have just been exposing everyone's dirty laundry in the process of this challenge. Yeah. Do you think it mattered where the mole was in this challenge? Uh, if I was the mole, I guess I'd want to be on the walkie-talkie. Because then you're directing when to pick up a tube or when not to pick up a tube. Or in Jan Willem's case, you just disregard whatever the person says and you just grab whatever tubes you want. Yeah, I think there's an argument for, for either, because if you're on the walkie-talkie, you're more likely to be able to sabotage both your line and the other lines because you can talk to people. But also it's way easier to sneakily take red notes from your own line. If you're the one abseiling. Susan was paired up with Jan Willem, right? She was, yeah. Wonder if she did the old hold down the button for too long and that's why he screwed up with which uh with which tubes to take. So the notes when they get down to us again, total twelve hundred euros, which he says is not bad for this team. 
However, he also tells them that a tube containing the black exemption was picked up, and it means that they earned 1,200 euros of 2,000 for the challenge, 1,550 of 5,250 for the episode, and 4,950 of 20,250 for the season so far, 2,750 of which has been sent to Ellis Island. And they could have earned an extra 18,050 euros from Ellis Island with interest. And that's a lot of money. Mm. And then we get the whole discussion between, between, oh, well. <laughs> we get the frisking scene first. Yes, yes. Menifer frisks Tigo, but then gives, gives up. Daphne's the one who tries to frisk Tigo. Oh, Daphne? Oh, pardon me. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have that in my notes. I have the two notes. Daphne nearly fills up Tigo's disc, and then later on, the, later on, back in the hotel, Tigo whips it out for a bit and lets Sophie hold it. So, yeah, obviously she's just being she's just being the prototype of everyone we see in future seasons frisking each other for exemptions and for yokers. I swear I'm looking for an exemption. She created her own archetype and she walked so that Olche Gulson could run. Imagine if this were if if somebody says, "Oh, I got violated on Vidim because somebody was searching me for an exemption." That'd be one weird trial on Dutch TV. Yeah, I presume they're not allowed to do that anymore. We're only a few years at this point from Men for Two. That's all I'm saying. So Tigo and uh, Sophie strategize over what to do with the black exemption. I believe Sophie catches Tigo in a lie about what he got in his envelope. She does, because she knows that Arf got the only envelope with one yoka, so she knows that he lied about only having one. He thinks that they've got a great pact but she doesn't trust him, quite understandably. And he says he's looking forward to not playing it and messing with people at the execution. They plan to use Freke as a gossip and not have anything played so that the test will be completely fair. Their plan does not work. I don't think there's really any reason not to use it. Because if you use it, all the advantages are dead and everyone's equal. If you don't use it, everyone else uses their advantages and you're at a disadvantage. If you say you're going to use it and you don't, then all the Jokers, exemptions and everything that's still in the game have more power next time. Yeah, I think from a non-black exemption holder point of view, you probably do play your your advantages in this test, because are they really going to immediately play a black exemption twice in this season? Probably not. I would have hedged my bets and probably played any advantages I had in this test. And also, if you suspect that Tico's got it, you know he's erratic enough to probably go, oh, I'm just going to mess with people and claim that I'm going to play it and then not play it now. Which is exactly what he does. So it's now time for the test. 20 questions on the identity and actions of the mole. Whoever knows the goes home, except for the mole who can never go home. Tico's got a black exemption, Freak's got a green one, Arf, Daphne and Susan have one yoker each, and Tico and Menifer both have three. Tico says that everyone's suspicious, so you have to split on three people. His main target is Sophie, though, and he plays his three yokers. Arf is hedging her bets over three people, but has one main suspect, and she plays a yoker. Sophie's main suspects are Susan and Arf. Arf scored some minus money, and Susan got Jan Willem to skip some cash. Jan Willem says everyone could be the mole. Right from the start, he suspected women, so he'll continue with that and go for two or three of them. Daphne says it's tough to know who she suspects, as everyone is trying to be suspicious, and she plays a yoker. Susan says she doesn't have a single mole, so she's hedging her bets, and she plays a yoker. Freak is sticking to the same people, Arf, Sophie, and Menifer. All the women except Susan. He doesn't play his exemption then. And Menifer doesn't know. She said it could be anyone. And she plays two yokers. So Freak was Freak was the only one to hang on to his item? Yes, he was. He was the only one who didn't play a single thing. Menifer played two, I think, of her yokers. And she got three. Tico obviously didn't play his black exemption, but he played all three of his yokers. And Arf, Daphne, and Susan all played their yokers. Okay, I got that right then. I think Menifer only played two of hers. So Art says that someone was living on borrowed time, and that borrowed time has now come to an end. Someone is going to be leaving just before they leave Hong Kong. He confirms the black exemption was not used, so all exemptions and yokers will stand. And we get a brilliant reaction because Tico expects everyone to be really shocked at this, and he's literally the only person other than Freak who actually reacts in the slightest. Tigo looks like he's about to go into convulsions with the way he's sitting in this chair when the when Art announces the black exemption wasn't used. For a professional actor, Tico is an awful actor. 
He is such a ham in this scene. He's like, oh, nobody played the Black Exemption. I wonder who has it. Oh my god. Tico, we know you have it. Just not for the first time this episode. Whip it out. Just show everyone. <laughs> so Frake, Tico and Sophie all get green screens before Daphne's red one becomes permanent. I love that Arf cries more at Daphne being eliminated than Daphne does. And then Jan Willem brags that, oh, I'm at advantage now because only one of my suspects remains. Assuming his suspects are correct. Yes. Because we don't know who he suspected in this test. Arf says it was a difficult execution as they exchanged a lot of information and laughed a lot with each other. Menifer was shocked as Daphne was one of her suspects. She thought it would be a huge twist to give the mold the initial red screen. Jan Willem says he spread over two people, including her, so he's been very lucky, and he only has one suspect left. And Daphne is emotional outside, mainly because she was saying goodbye to Arf. She knew she'd done badly on the test, she voted for one person too much accidentally, and that person wasn't even her main suspect. What a great candidate she was. Do you guys want to eulogise her, given I forgot who she was pre-season? Uh, it's, it's always interesting to see somebody do very poorly at the moment. Makes you appreciate just how tough of a game it really is. Yeah. I'll also say that Daphne was my third suspect in week one. Neither of us have lost anyone up until this point, but Daphne was my third suspect in week one. Daphne represents what a typical person would be like when playing them all. Just getting consistently outplayed by people who are playing at a much higher intensity. Yeah. Yeah, she was perfectly nice. Oh. She just wasn't cut out for the mole. No. She turned up in her pyjamas on day one and then just never woke up. So next time, Art is looking for two people with an eye for detail. Someone gets lumps on her neck. There's laser tag on boats, which I'd completely forgotten about and is awesome. And the trip moves to the Philippines. Not that they still have actually told us that, but you can tell from the fact that, you know, you see the Filipino flag at one point in the next time trailer. And I believe... If my memory is correct, they go to Vegan first. Oh, okay. Way up north. They went there in uh, Maze and Race Asia. They did. I think it's Vegan and then uh, El Nido are the only two places to go in the Philippines, unless I'm forgetting anywhere. I think Lao. So, Mr. Saunders, who do you suspect? So, my list from top to bottom, Af is number one, Jan Willem is two, Sophie is three, Freak is four, Susan five, uh, Menifer is six, and Daphne was at the very bottom. And she went home. Have you guys got anything else you want to say? I'm good. No, I think we covered it. Excellent. In that case, thank you for listening to our Mole 2014 recap. We'll be back next week to continue the hunt for an older mole in Hong Kong and the Philippines. Don't forget you can contact us on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, or Instagram where we are RTV Warriors, or you can email us and contact at rtvwarriors.com. Logan is on Twitter at Logs Quacky. Bindles is the Grim Recapper, and I'm MJ Harmstone. You can also support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash rtvwarriors. Thank you as always to Marika for the subtitles, and we'll see you next week. Peace out and just chill till the next flavoring. i got to go find a bassoon. <laughs>